welcome to the Metal Voice. Today we got uh, Zebras, I guess, guitarist, singer, Randy Jackson. How are you guys doing? Great. Good, good. good. Would it be safe to say driving force behind Zebra? Is that be safe to say? I drive occasionally. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, all three of us, it's Zebra. Without one of us, it would just wouldn't be Zebra. So, yeah, yeah, I agree I with that, right? Write, I do write most of the songs, and uh, so I have a little force behind it, yeah. <laughs> the good known to is, sing a song or two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the good news is Zebra 2023 tour dates in celebration of the 40 year anniversary of oh, the that debut looked familiar. album. Look at that. Wow. 1983 it was released. I can't all original members. You're starting yeah. uh, your next show is uh, St. Charles, Illinois, then New Jersey, then you're going back to Illinois, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, California, and LA. Yeah, we just did the the uh, the St. Charles. Oh, game. sorry. Yes, yes. My bad. That My was bad. Uh, that was this past Saturday. But uh, we're going back to I think St. Louis is the next one. near St. Louis. It's right outside of St. Louis. I say the Landis uh, Theater, New Jersey. Yeah. No, is the, that it? that's oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're correcting me. Okay. So I screwed up on you're the right, first part, right. and you screwed up Landis on the second theater. part. <laughs> we're all St. St. Charles is a lovely city. I love that place. Yeah, we, we so, had a good time, and a lot of people came from all over to see the show, so it was fun. Uh, cool. Yeah, Landis Theater is the next one in New Jersey, right? That's yeah. this Friday. I got my little uh, Zebra album, too. They were in Long Island at the but, uh, at the space in Westbury. Look at that. So, so take us back. That That's your old stomping grounds, right? Long Island, that whole uh, area? Yeah. I mean, we're not from Long Island, but uh, Long Island became our second home back in, like, 1977. Uh, we moved to New York around that time, and uh, and I've I've been living here for I'm in Long Island now. I've been living here for 35 years now. So, so the transplant from New Orleans, how was that? Um, it was interesting. Uh, <laughs> I bet know, the I mean, early like, 80s in New like York, every, like every other band, we had uh, just some crazy stuff happen to us along the way, and uh, you know, of getting here and uh, uh, just. Just a lot of insanity, you know, but uh, but we made it and we kind of pushed our ways, pushed our way up here. And uh, then uh, we were afforded the opportunity to open up for a lot of bands who were doing really well on the circuit here, which helped us uh, get established pretty quickly here on Long Island. I remember those Hipperator back pages with Zebra, you know, the Rush slash what else was it? Rush and what, the next Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. The next Zeppelin. I remember the, those the, that eighty three, the year eighty three when Zebra. What the Zebra? What's yeah. this all about? Yeah. You know, it's there's a bizarre name for this bizarre prog rock heavy metal band. Yeah, uh, it was exciting. Yeah, we. Uh, it's a good thing it was Zebra because uh, the name of the band before Zebra was Maelstrom. <laughs> oh, okay. But Zebra was bizarre. <laughs> Maelstrom would have gone down a little worse, you know. But uh, what were the covers you were playing? Okay, I know you're playing Rush, but give me some songs that you were doing back in the day. Oh, uh, we played, uh, you know, from you know, really commercial, taking care of business. Uh, ZZ Top, uh, Lagrange, Tush, uh, Jesus just left Chicago. We played uh, Aerosmith, uh, you know, uh, Sweet Emotion. Walk That Way, Last Child. Uh, we did um, uh, Deep Purple, You Fool No One. Uh, we did some Moody Blues. We did uh, Story in Your Eyes. We did uh, Beatles. I think it was uh, back in the USSR. We played Rolling Stones, Can't You Hear Me Knocking, Monkey Man. <laughs> kind of like just just off the, uh, off the chart songs by the Stones, but they were cool. We liked them. Um, we did. Uh, I mean, we. Pl I, I actually counted up the stuff, the different bands that we played, from from 1975 up until like 1980, and there were 60 different bands that we played songs by. Did you play yeah. Rush Xanadu? No, no, no. We just did. Uh, what was it? Uh, Farewell to Kings. Oh. We played uh, Spirit of the Radio, and uh, Passage to Bangkok. Those were the three oh, songs. Nice. And we didn't even start playing Rush until fans, you know, people started asking us to do it, you know. Uh, can you do some Rush? Can you? And I said, okay. Because when we started off, it was pretty much the, 
the bands that we grew up with, like Bad Company. We played Bad Company, uh, you know, all the stuff from the early 70s. Uh, Montrose Rock Candy was one of the songs. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but yeah. the, the fact that we got, you know, that Zeppelin was the re, you know, the whole thing is is kind of weird to me, but I, I just go along with it. I can't fight it anymore. People are just like, yeah, we're a Zeppelin tribute band, right? I said, uh, whatever you say. <laughs> you know, yeah. it really wasn't like that. You know, we played a lot. We played Wishbone Ash, if you know Wishbone Ash. Yeah. We mm-hmm. play, yeah. We played Blow and Free and... Uh, God, I could keep going on and on. I remember some, I remember different bands all the time. Uh, uh, Bridge of Size by Robin Trower, uh, Day of the Eagle. Um, I mean, we played Hendrix, Crosstown Traffic. It, it just goes on and on. We played a lot of songs that I keep remembering more and more. Uh, Love Hurts. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, but Zeppelin was the thing that people, you know, they wanted to hear more of it. And I think what happened was when we came out, um, we started playing live in 1975. And, you know, I was always a big Blood Zeppelin fan and we were doing some Zeppelin. We learned some Zeppelin. Um, but when uh, Physical Graffiti came out, we just mm-hmm. grabbed the album. It came out right at that time when we were coming out and we just like dug into it, you know, said, let's learn these songs right now so we don't have to, you know, be asked for them later. And uh, we learned a lot of stuff off of physical graffiti. And uh, and so we had these songs in our back pocket and we just keep throwing them in. And I think maybe maybe that had something to do with it. It's the only record I remember really coming out at the time that we, you know, we jumped on top of, you know, was the. Uh, and I think it's graffiti. the falsetto head voice that you do, you know, that is reminiscent yeah. of Robert Plant. Right. As soon as people hear that, they go, wait a second. Is that Robert Plant? Yeah. Type style. Right. Yeah, that's it's it's the style. It's Plant's voice is amazing. I mean, he does he, he it's no falsetto with him, especially his early days. You know, he was just that was just his natural voice. He just walk in there and just blast it. Uh, when we started out, you know, each of us sang lead. I sang, Felix sang a bunch of stuff. Guy sang. Guy had a big big voice. He used to sing the lead in "You Fool No One," the Deep Purple song. You know, mm-hmm. um, but um, we all did. A Zeppelin song or a couple of Zeppelin songs. You know, we all took turns doing Zeppelin and I just ended up doing the stuff that was higher because, you know, because I went to my falsetto uh, and used it. Uh, they, they when Felix and Guy sang it, they did it all in their natural voices and it they, it only went up, they could only go up so high, you know. And my natural voice wasn't any higher than theirs, but I just developed my falsetto to be stronger. Uh, mm-hmm over time and uh and then ended up doing all the zeppelin so that's how kind of how that happened they kind of uh you know developed the style of singing that you know i'd be doing with uh the original songs too i mean if we go back to 83 like jimmy said anybody that had a certain voice or a certain sound everybody was being uh touted as the next led zeppelin i guess there was a gap because i mean obviously zeppelin had broken up by then and I guess they were looking for that band to take, you know, what was possibly the greatest band of the seventies to uh, take their place. So they, they they kept putting these. I mean, Diamond Head in in in, in England was the, the dub the next Led Zeppelin. So it's like they were constantly searching for that next next band to take over. So yeah, I mean, and they've been searching ever since. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, it, it hasn't stopped, you know. Uh, but it was only like three years after, you know. John Bonham had passed away that uh, that our record came out. So, I mean, there was, yeah, there was a, that, that was a lot to handle. I mean, it was like, you know, Zeppelin was off, off the chart, you know, then, you know, and you kept thinking maybe they'll get back together with another drummer. And they, they just didn't do it. And because they're right. It wouldn't have been Led Zeppelin without him, you know, that's right. Such a big part of their sound and, uh, and such an influential drummer. So, um, but, um, yeah, I mean, Fastway was another band. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember them talking, but they had a kind of, he had a great voice and it was high and, you know. Yeah, well, I, I got my, I got my, so you spiked your circus magazine, I got her one way here. You guys, <laughs> exactly, you're lumped in with Fastway, Fastway Show the picture. Y&T, and Zebra, filling the Zep gap. 
There you go. <laughs> You're right there in 83 with all those show other it. bands. You're right. Show it, Alan. Show it. Show the cover. I want to see it. I'm curious. But it's a little bit of a dog-eared cover. There's uh, Kevin Dubrow. Choir Riot, of course, was leading the charge in 83. So what the, so what the tri-state area, I mean, reading Dee Snyder's book, it sounded like you guys and Twisted Sister were the ones of the two biggest bands in that whole area. And you could you can make a good living doing that 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 uh, circuit. Yeah, I mean, by 1979, 1980, we were pretty, you know, settled on the fact that we weren't getting a record deal. We had moved to New York originally to get a record deal, but we had come up here, we had made some demos, and, um, and we had shopped the demos, and all the record companies had turned us down. So... But we were making great, great money. I mean, <laughs> I just kind of said, well, we could just do this. I'm not worried about it. You know, so I bought a house. Me and my wife bought a house down in uh, Louisiana. And we moved in there. And the plan was just to, you know, keep playing New Orleans and New York and areas like close to there. You know, we're not going to be going out on the road. I didn't think it planning on that anyway. And at least for that time, just, you know, OK, they don't want us. No big deal. I mean, Atlantic Records has, had actually told us, you know, if you guys had come to us like 10 years ago, we would have signed you, you know, but your music <laughs> is really dated. And uh, But, yeah, we, we, when we first got up here, one of the first bands we opened up for was Twisted Sister. So, Hey, what, was that, what was that like? I mean, you know, you're seeing them at their, wow, this is before any of their records came out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. None of us had records. At that was time. D. Snyder actually in the band back then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. D was in the band. The only person, well, there were two people that weren't in the band uh, at that point that you, uh, of the band, you're, you're familiar with when the records came out. And one of them was, uh, there was a guy named AJ. Yep. Um, Perro. Well, yeah, Perro. AJ Perro. He yeah. wasn't in the band originally. Um, and Mark Mendoza was mm -hmm. not in the band. Uh, they had a different bass player and a different drummer. And but D and Eddie and um, and JJ were in the band, and what I remember when we we had heard about them, you know, so <laughs> we were there on our sound check, and then they came in to do their sound check, and you know they were just dressed like us, you know, it was no, <laughs> weren't, uh, you know, it was no nothing crazy, and so you know I was like, all right, well it's not as crazy as we thought, you know. Um, because usually with bands that had that kind of reputation, they kind of wear it, you know, or have some something going on even outside of the performance thing. You know, they'd be like, they're like oh, always on stage. But it wasn't like that with Twisted. But then, you know, we played a, uh, uh, our set, and then I was it was downstairs where there was the dressing rooms in this place. It was called Hammerheads Levittown. And... Uh, and D, the door opens up to their dressing room, and D comes out in a pink negligee. I mean, and I and I swore for all these years, I said it was a pink negligee, even though his, his clothing changed. I never saw it again. That was the only time I saw that thing. But I swore to people, I swear it was a pink negligee. Uh, you know, and my memory isn't the greatest, but that one struck me. And sure enough, uh, when they were putting together the Long Island Music Hall of Fame here in here uh, in Long Island, and they were they D had sent them a bunch of, bunch of the clothing, uh, he sent that piece of clothing, and and the uh, and the guy that was putting together the whole uh, exhibit, uh, Kevin, he he knows D really well, and he said, yeah, D told me that he only wore this once. That was the only show he wore it at, but. <laughs> It was like, you know, his wife had made it, Suzette, and, uh, and it was a special, so they put it up in the, uh, in the museum. And, uh, so that was an eye-opener for you. Well, it was, it was a relief. You know, I, I hadn't been, you know, I said I knew it was a negligee. And it, it was. Did you guys feel close. underdressed? It was close to a negligee, let's put it that way. We had Did you guys feel dress. like out of place, underdressed? <laughs> like no, no, it was just a little more feminine that then they became, you know, I mean, they became like, they kept the, the wild clothing, but they, the aggressiveness of the band, I think they, that with that, mm -hmm. uh, even during the clubs before their record deal, I mean, they, they changed their, mm -hmm. their look and, uh, because they were, they were just monstrous on stage. I mean, you, you, you know, you didn't want to be playing pinball when Twisted Sister was, 
plan, you know, because if you were going to get the spotlight on you and you were getting called out, it was, uh, it was, it was quite a show. A lot of- Great story. Great story. Yeah. So, okay. So you're in the tri-state area, you're building up that fan base. Uh-huh. Atlantic Records signs you, right? Yeah. What was it? Was it a demo? Was it a showcase? How did that sort of happen? Well, it was actually a radio station. Um, you know, when, when, it, when we were shopping the demos originally, uh, the radio station here on Long Island, WBAB, uh, had a show on called Homegrown, which would uh, yeah. showcase, you know, local bands, original material. And the program director came to us and said, can I, you know, can we play one of your demos on the show? And I said, sure. So I gave him all the, all the demos, just the whole demo package. And uh, he started, he played a song on the radio and uh, it got a lot of, you know, response and started getting... Uh, what song was yes. it? And he, he put it into regular rotation on the station. Jeez, back and back. Um, and it kept getting more requests. And then he added another song, you know, and that one started getting requests. And we were just really, really popular. I mean, like like Dee said, you know, we were the two most popular bands on Long Island at that point, you know, uh, local bands. And um, and so we, there was no record. People had to, like, call the radio station unless they recorded it, you know, while it was playing. But... Uh, and anyway, that was going on. It was nice to hear it on the radio and everything, but still resolved that there's not going to be any record deal. But uh, a guy from Atlantic Records went to WBAB to talk to the program director, Bob Buckman, yeah, about some business with Atlantic. And, and during the conversation, Bob brought up, you know, you guys are missing the boat. There's a band here, Zebra, that's got the most requested songs at the station. They got the five most requested songs. And uh, Jason says, uh, oh, you mean like for a local band? He says, no, I'm talking <laughs> period. And he shows him the list of the top 10. And like number six is, uh, you know, uh, I think ACDC, uh, Back in Black. Then, I mean, this is and this is like 1979, 1980. Then, he's, then there's Led Zeppelin, All of My Love. And uh, a lot of the stuff was on Atlantic. So Jason was like, what? These are our bands. They're not getting... He says, "Yeah, they they get more requests than uh, than all these bands." And uh, so Jason was like, "Wow, this he 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 wasn't really an A and R guy at the time, but that was his goal." So, but he did have an in with the president, the new president of Atlantic Records, a guy named Doug Morris. So he brought the tape back to Doug Morris and said, "Doug, these guys are the most requested thing at this station." And blah 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 blah. And uh, you know, Doug said, "Okay, Jason, I'll check it out." And, uh, well, we were signed pretty much immediately, but like years later, I found out that, that what had happened was that Doug had gone and gotten in his car and he was being driven home. And, it, you know, it's like a limo. He's got, it's not his car. It's, and he gets in the back seat and he puts the tape in uh, to listen to the, the demo. And uh, the first song on the tape is Who's Behind the Door? You know, and it's got the long acoustic intro. Right. Well, he listens to about 30 seconds of it and there's no vocal. and There's no hook there's, at this point. So this is out and he just ejects the tape. Right. And uh, but it but the radio station that's on, you know, because he plugs, you know, back then mm-hmm. you had the, the, uh, the cassette uh, player with the radio built in is tuned into WBAB and uh, they're playing who's behind the door. Pretty much it's that. <laughs> at that point of the song, right? And he, of course, he's confused, you know, and he puts the tape back in, ejects it again, and now he realizes this thing's on the radio. So he listens to it on the radio, and then, you know, at the end, the DJ says, you know, that's the most requested song at the station here, uh, Zebra, who's behind the door. And uh, so then, uh, so then all of a sudden we were, it was brilliant. <laughs> it was brilliant stuff. And, uh, and we got signed. So, uh, you know, that, was, that was pretty lucky. <laughs> wow. That's that doesn't happen today, right? It produced the album produced by Jack Douglas. I think he did uh, quite a bit of work with Aerosmith, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yeah, I mean we you know they asked us who would you like to work with? We hadn't worked with a, a an outside producer at that point. And uh so I just started like I didn't really know that. I mean I knew uh who was it? I knew that the Zeppelin produced their own stuff. Uh, but, and I knew, uh, 
you know, that George Martin produced the Beatles, but outside of that, I was like, not really too <laughs> producer savvy, but I said, okay, who produced these records, you know, and I could look on and Jack Douglas was at the top of our list, you know, he had done Double Fantasy, he had done Aerosmith and, uh, you know, he had worked with uh, Cheap Trick too, who I loved. And I said, let's, let's see if we'll, he'll do it, you know, but we had a, we had a long list and Jack, you know, said yes right away. He had never done a record for Atlantic up until that point, and Atlantic was happy to have him. He had just, you know, won Producer of the Year for Double Fantasy, and he was just, you know, but he was still, you know, he was a good friend of John Lennon's, and the thing I'm not thinking about is that, you know, that's a, that really did affect him a lot, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, it's just great to have this guy, you know, but uh, it was pretty interesting doing the whole... Uh, the two first two records with him, and uh, it was great. He's got a great, great sense of humor. Did and, you have a lot of leverage? So because this is more like a pull strategy, they're coming to you in, instead of you going to them, right, and begging yeah. them. Right. I, I'm assuming when that situation occurs, the artist has more leverage, and you could say, you know, I don't like this deal. You know, I, I want to, you know, another zero there. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, the record deal was, I think, a little better than. Uh, than most, uh, I mean, I, I, I know at one point, uh, there was a, a clause about the publishing and I just said, that's a deal breaker, you know, that they wanted something, I forget exactly what it was, but they said, okay, they gave, gave back on that. They gave us an extra couple of points for Jack, for Jack Douglas. And, um, you know, and, and another thing was, was that they didn't come to us making suggestions, you know, because we, we had already like we had five songs that were on the radio and they were yeah. you know, they were working. So they weren't like creatively telling us anything. They'd kind of let, just let Jack and, and the band uh, do the first record. And so, I, I, you know, after hearing a lot of horror stories from different labels and other bands that I knew, uh, you know, we had it pretty easy. So you're right. You know. Yeah. Um. No, I mean, so so on this tour now, you're playing the album in its entirety? Yeah, in order. We've done okay. the album in its entirety previously, but uh, but this is the first time we're doing it in, in order. And funny enough, we, when we played it on at the Arcata uh, on Saturday night, we got on stage, and I had just woken up from a nap. I was taking a nap downstairs because I had flown in that morning from New Jersey. And I get on stage. I'm ready to go. I'm rested and everything. But I just look at Felix and Guy and say, okay, we're going to start off with I said before, right? And neither of them says anything. They're just, okay. And we Guy counts it off. We go into the song. And then the next song, I go right into No Telling Lies, okay? And we're playing No Telling Lies. And then all of a sudden... I go into uh, When You Get There, another song from the first record, right? And about halfway through there, Felix starts mouthing something to me. You know, I think he realizes this isn't what we're supposed to be doing. So at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the song, you know, of course, he's like hammering me, blaming me for it, you know. And uh, it turned into a comedy show, pretty much. But, uh, but at that point, we stopped. You know, there, and we started off, you know, with uh, Tell Me What You Want and, and ran through the uh, the record. When we got eventually got to a set, said before, I said, listen, you know, we made a promise and we're doing this, so we play it a set before again. Uh, we didn't do When You Get There Again. If we just yeah, well, skipped that yeah, one, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, only, but only because Felix and Guy were just not into, like, repeating two of the songs. And, uh I would have done it, you know. I'm game for anything, but uh, so, but, so the, yeah, yeah. So the first album's released, right? We're Going old. Back in time. We're old. Go ahead. And 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 we keep seeing the same statement: the fastest selling album, you know, in Atlantic history at the time, right? Or fa fastest well, selling. Clear that up. What, what does okay. that mean? Fastest selling debut album. Okay. Now, debut album for for Atlantic meant that. The band couldn't have put out an album before, and nobody in the band could have been on a record before. Okay. So I, you know, I don't know how many Led Zeppelin sold when 
their first record came out, but Jimmy Page had been with the Yardbirds, so he had been on record. So, you know, I don't think they they didn't count them. Anybody who had, who had who had had a career in recording was not counted. But this was a debut album. Everybody in the record was it was their debut, and uh, and yeah, it was the fastest selling, which you know meant that. We obviously promoted ourselves into being one of the biggest bar bands in the world, and people wanted the record, you know. So, yeah, uh, I, and I still, I don't know that that re I think the record may still stand, you know, for a for a new debut artist because I can't imagine selling that many records that quick. You know, it was only like ten days we sold almost a hundred thousand records. Ooh. Yeah. They must have been fully stocked at all the record store. This was they must. Have, I mean, right? Supply. Well, yeah, but they. But the reason they were so stocked was because they, when they made the announcement that the record was yes. coming out, the stores in these in New York and New Orleans ordered them. They knew yeah. that yeah. there were going to be this. Many it was on customers. the radio. It was a time to make the you know some some bucks there, right? Yeah, yeah. and they they shipped out that many records, so they the, it was available. And uh, if it wasn't it wasn't for your sort of a base that you created. It would have been the opposite story, right? They wouldn't have had enough supply to meet the demand. Um, because that's what happens to a lot of bands, like these breakout albums. Yeah. Suddenly, you know, there's popular for a week or two, and the the record stores used to miss the boat because they couldn't produce them fast enough. But because yeah. you already had the pre-orders or the stores already excited about this yeah. band, this was a very rare situation. No, but it was due to your base, your, yeah, your base that you built. That's a lot of doing. bands. They'll come out and then they would get airplay for you know a couple of weeks, and then all of a sudden, wow, you know, there's a lot of requests, and then the labels don't have the supply, and they're playing, they're playing catch up. But considering that labels would put out hundreds of records a year, you know, they'd be foolish to, you know, make multiple copies of, of anything until they had a demand for it, you know? Yeah. Um, so, but they knew, they knew from the beginning, you know, I mean, I, uh, I used to work in a record store back in the day. So I could see, you know, when they, when they missed the boat, like if nobody knew about you beforehand, those hundred thousand probably wouldn't have been, it would have been half. Yeah. yeah you, miss, you, you miss a sale. It's not available. You miss the sale. Yeah, that's right. That's no right. And then they move that. on, right? But because of your bass, that was so strong that it's a testament to the the music. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, it was, you know, a testament to the fans inquiring about it, you know, and the record stores were fully aware in the area that the, of the popularity of the band, both, both in the... Uh, up here in the Northeast and in New Orleans. So and don't mind me. I'm just working stuff out in my head as we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just working it out of my head. Well, you if, you're, if you're, you, you work in a record store, then you understand how important it was not just to get airplay, but just to sell any record in a record store. So, you know, a, month, a couple of months went by. Uh, it, see, at least it seems to me before they got more orders for the record, because we had pretty much saturated the, the uh, the New York and the New Orleans area with the sales we were going to get from uh, from our popularity in those areas and now you know we were we were getting airplay in different radio stations and there was one in St Louis uh, Casey who mm -hmm. started playing Who's Behind the Door mm -hmm. and you know I think we sold seven seven albums in in St Louis and all of a sudden now Atlantic is going to start pumping money into promotion. That's that's what did it. It wasn't the first records, and it makes sense, you know. Well, they sold all these. We didn't have to do any promotion. But now, airplay turned into record sales in a different market than they had been in, and that was the thing. And they flew us right back to New York to make an, a video for MTV, and uh, and you know, and got it played on MTV, and then the whole thing started rolling, and we started selling more records, you know. So I went through. I, I, I love the song. Tell me what you want. Is that was that the first single, the first video? Yeah. You know what? I, I think it was "Who's Behind the Door." And that was okay. the first. "Who's Behind the Door" is definitely the first video. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm not sure whether it was the first single or not. It might have been that. I'd have to. I have to go back and check. Look, according to this article, the second <laughs> video was "Take Your Fingers from My Hair." Looks like they're or a brand new a brand new video they said in '83. No, take your fingers from my hair was not a video. Oh, okay. 
They messed up, Alan. Oh, it says right here in the... They send send a please. message to the editor, please. In 1983. It's time for a correction. <laughs> time for a retraction. All right. <laughs> no, I, I remember on MTV, well, you know, on the music video. We're in Canada, so... Uh -huh. I don't think we ever got you guys... Did you guys ever play in Canada? You know, we never did. It's really? It's so weird. Yeah, I mean, we sh there's a lot of things we should have done... And Canada was one of them. Europe was another one. We had the opportunity to go tour Europe for the second record, the No Tell and Lies record, but we had an offer to open up for Sammy Hager here in the United States, and we decided to do that instead. And um, and then after that, we just we just never went to Europe, so we hadn't played in Europe. We sold records in Europe, but never did tour. Hmm. I'm pretty. I'm pretty surprised about Montreal and Toronto since it's so close to the New York border. Yeah. yeah. Typically, bands just you know jump over the border just for a few shows and come back, go back. Yeah, we had, we had uh, Premier was our agency. They were a big agency, you know, yeah. and um, but they never booked us up there. You know, we never. We just never made it into Canada. We went to Alaska. <laughs> went, All the way up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, never, we never got into Canada. Did you go through Yukon or did you just fly in there? <laughs> I think we flew over. We flew over. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, has there been interest? I'm Well, look, if we're talking to you, there must have been some sort of interest and demand that's there in Canada that it's never been tapped into, I guess. Yeah. The, the, you know, over the years, there's been a lot. Um, and there's been... You know, people who thought we were from Canada. I guess the three piece thing. People say, "Oh, all the three piece." <laughs> you know, progressive pants are from Canada. You know, Triumph Rush, Zebra. It all makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they just, but, but yeah, we we just never did. I mean, I guess if if there was a promoter up there who really had, you know, was ready to put up the money to do it, it would have happened. But uh, mainly, it was like a maybe fans that were you know contacting us come up to Canada play at this place we might contact them or you know half-heartedly contact them i don't know uh you know after like 1988 and uh nothing just ever happened you know just you know maybe lazy on our part but you know atlantic had dropped us in 86 and and uh and then put another record out in 1990 but we were you know, all doing different things, still playing. The band played every year for the last 48 years. Wow. Um, was that, was what was a meeting like? Like, you, you know, you, you, they drop you. Like, they just bring you into a meeting. Look, guys, where our expectation was this, but it's not real. It's kind of static. static. What was that like? Well, they brought us in. They said, you know, we have a contract here that you guys are supposed to do five albums, but we want you to lay your heads on this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guy with his big machete he's gonna chop our heads off he says you could you got your choice you get what we mean and uh no i'm just i'm kidding they didn't even we didn't even have a meeting they just you know let our management know that uh they weren't gonna they didn't want to do a fourth album um and the funny thing was i was really really proud of the third record i thought it was it's a great album great record yeah. i it was the only record that i had really written at the time you know, the first two records that were, you know, a, the first record, certainly all the songs had been written between 75 and 1979. And the second record, there was maybe maybe three or four songs that were written during that same time period. Uh, and, and the rest were like pieces of songs that I had written during that time period. But the third record, except for Hard Living Without You, was all written after the second record while we were on the road. And it and it kind of you, you can tell. I, I think it sounds more like a, a collection of songs that were meant to be together than uh, you know than the other two records. Uh, and so I was like scratching my head, but uh, it was kind of like game over. I remember when the third record came out, uh, we were on the road, and there was another mistake we might have made. We wanted to I wanted to play more of our material instead of just playing for 40 minutes, opening up some, for somebody. So we, we went out and, uh, and we headlined, you know, maybe theaters, small theaters or clubs. And, um, and when we'd go into the towns, you know, Atlantic would have interviews set up for us. And inevitably, one of the first questions would, would be, man, what do you think about this Bon Jovi phenomenon? 
you know. <laughs> and you know, Bon Jovi was just like this was when it was just exploding, and mm -hmm. uh, and so we got kind of lost in the sauce there, and um, and we weren't really a quote unquote eighties band, hair band, you know. We were we were like a laid back t shirt kind of guys from the from the seventies, and uh, it, uh, that might have had something to do with it, but you know. I, I, I certainly don't think we would have changed just for that, you know, but that, things that, were changing at the time. No that's what I was thinking. I was thinking of that earlier. See, the, the black and white, I get it, our zebra black and white album cover. But, you know, yeah. five years later, you probably have black and white paint all over your face or stripes on your face or something. <laughs> if that happened in the later <laughs> age. Stripe, so. Striped panties. <laughs> yeah, or actual uniform zebra costumes or something though so. it's like a kiss thing happening right a zebra oh, well you had to beat kiss you know yeah you know it's it's also amazing that um how the band sort of got reignited like you know on cobra kai right um it, and i and that was a fluke right that was that was another right that was just a testament to the music and to the love from uh Johnny Lawrence, who's like William Z Zapka, right? Yeah. Um, he, uh, he, he, the story is, it was his original, original, right? His original uh, audition, correct? Yes, for the movie. Back Karate in, Kid. Sorry. Karate Kid. Mm -hmm. Back in 80s. Yeah. Was, uh, <laughs> Tell us about he that. Went, he went to the audition uh, listening to No Telling Lies, that record, to get psyched up for the, uh, you know, for the audition. And he got it, so... That was kind of, I guess, his tribute to it, you know, in a subtle way to people who knew, you know, the story. And uh, then we started hearing about it. Did you, did you see your T-shirts on Cobra Kai? And I said, on what? <laughs> I wasn't well, even aware of it. Well, I, told, I told Alan, I go, do you watch Cobra Kai? He goes, no. I go, well, it's kind of like, for everybody who doesn't know, it's a reboot or a continuation of Karate Kid 30, 40 years later, right? Yeah. So. You know the same characters, the same guys, but of course they're 30, 40 years, whatever it is, later. And and you know, and you could spot him wearing the zebra shirt. And the first time I saw it, I go, "What? What's yeah. going on here?" He wears an ACDC shirt. He wears a Metallica shirt. Then he's got the zebra shirt. This is cool, man. This is cool stuff. Yeah, we. It was. Um, you know, the show is great. That made it even better. You know, it's a really good show. I, I started watching it, and uh, it, the writing is good, and it's it's it's. It's it's an awesome show, so that that even made it better. And it's still has he called you? Has he called you? Uh... No, but I have friends that know him. Um, I think maybe they called me when they were at dinner with him one time. Some friends from upstate, you know, and uh, but I haven't actually talked to him yet. But uh, you know, but we've been in communication through other people. And I think that would be a cool meeting. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a nice photo op. There. Save it, save it for a. Uh, for a live video, you know? Well, okay. What about a new album? Are you working on it? Is it going to be a Zebra 5? I've been saying that for 20 <laughs> yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it's embarrassing at this point. Um, I mean, I started writing, you know, right after the fourth album, and I had a, I've got so much material, it's just ridiculous. And I guess it, it just seems to me like time is getting, you know, the days are shorter <laughs> as we get older and, uh, and they get filled up. You know, I can make every excuse in the book. I got a lot of them after 20 years, but, uh, but I, I do have a ton of material. We, we actually did start working on some, uh, doing arrangements in November to play live at a couple of shows we did last year. And we had worked on them, but Guy and Felix were not confident enough to play them on stage. And so we didn't. And and now we're playing again, and we're going to have to, re I think, revisit the songs again to, to be able to play them. But I hope there's a Zebra 5, and I do hope that all, we're all still alive when it comes out. You know? <laughs> it's just, it's it's stupid. I remember when, when, when Zebra 4 came out, Guy, Guy says, oh, this is great. Let's do an album every year. We could just throw them out there, throw them out. I said, no, I said, let's don't just throw them out there. I said, I don't want it to be like a, a shit trail, you know, for, uh, for the rest of the career. Let's, let's make sure the stuff is good. But that wasn't even really the, the reason it just one year goes after another, you get involved in other stuff. You got family, 
you're making a living playing live mainly, you know, and then with the downloads and everything, it wasn't, you know, there's no record company uh, putting up money to have you stop working. So we were always working. It was just one thing after another, but there will be a Zebra 5, hopefully soon. Well, at least we got, <laughs> we got the album We got the album title. What's that? Yeah. We, Zebra 5. We got the album title. <laughs> 20 <laughs> years in the making. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, when Zebra 4 came out, it had been 17 years oh. since the third album. And we thought, wow, that'll never happen again. You know, you know that's ridiculous. Well, we were but, right. I, but, I, but Randy, I'm going to say something. There has been sort of this new, uh, new curiosity for Zebra. And, and, you know, I think the timing is a lot better now, my opinion, mm-hmm. than it was when the Zebra 4 came out. Yeah, it's Zebra, very possible. You know, I, I, I think people are really looking at the band a lot, you know, out of curiosity and wondering. I, I don't know. That's my opinion. And plus LPs, right? Yeah. Albums are being, vinyls being released. So maybe the time is right. Yeah, well, and if it is, you know, it'll be a good record because, you know, we I got 20 freaking years of material uh, to go. Oh, wow, yeah. It's like the first album, right? You're just build. you're taking the best from the first two albums and you put them out. So now you're at the same position, exactly, with yeah. experience. Yeah, 20. I'm motivating, I'm motivating you, Randy. That's what I'm doing. New material, yeah. I, I don't I don't need much motivating. I'm, 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 uh, I'm ready to get, you know, get this thing done. Believe okay. me. Okay. But another possible album title, "The Zebra Democracy." If it's if it's been that long in in the making, so it's a do- sort of the Chinese democracy. democracy. Oh, <laughs> I don't know about that. You know, no stripes, no stripes. That's no another stripes. name for that. No stripes. I mean, I think we would have uh, the political uh, title, even if it just says "Democracy." Uh, we we have a lot of fans that that are, you know both Democrat or Republican, but we kind of stay away from there. But fortunately for the band, we all kind of are on the same page politically. And I think that's why (laughs) we haven't had really big problems with the band staying together. At least that, that never entered into, uh, into the discussion. But uh, a lot of band names happening, same page, uh, you know, Zebra, well, yeah, same I mean, page, no stripes. It's got a lot of things. Democracy wouldn't be, wouldn't be one, but come up with something else. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm listening. I, I, yeah. um, I want to ask you one last question. Uh, sure. uh, Dream Theater cover, has that also reignited the band? You know, uh, Take Your Hands From My Hair, their, their cover of your song. Was that a surprise as well? Um, yeah, I didn't know it was going to happen. And... Yeah, my, I think Mike had sent me a, an email letting us know that they were putting the, the song on uh, on an album, and I was flattered, you know. I mean, we had played some shows with them uh, early on in their career when they were they called themselves Majesty and uh, before they changed the name to Dream Theater, and we knew they were great. You know, they were great back then. And uh, so we were flattered that they did it, and then I heard it, and uh, they stuck pretty much to the original version you know even the guitar solo was i mean he added some flurry at the end that was that i didn't do but uh, uh it, it was pretty uh, true to the original and uh and, yeah. and it was great great version so yeah i, agree. I, think, and I think you're right you know it, it's certainly dream theater had a worldwide audience that uh, a lot of them had never heard of zebra so there was definitely a, a renewed interest in the band from a lot of people you know now yeah. you got to cover a dream theater song yeah <laughs> Oh, well, I guess we could do Take Your Fingers From My Hair. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we could cover uh, so, our own song. <laughs> as Alan said, 2023 tour dates and celebration of the 40 years of the 40 debut years. album. 40 years. 1983 debut album, Zebra. Simply just called Zebra. The next show is at the Landis Theater in New Jersey on April the 14th. And it goes all the way uh, April. There's some shows in May. There's some shows in June. And even uh, in November, House of Blues in New Orleans. I guess that yeah. would be your last show. And we're adding more. We've got like I think another ten, you know, that that are being confirmed as we speak and just not been announced. So we're we're touring more this time this year than we have in probably twenty years. Wow! And the zebra zebra VIP, you get to ride a zebra. Yes. <laughs> and you get to choose which of us you get to ride. <laughs> 
<laughs> you you could do a meet and greet, uh, you know, a signed commemorative poster, zebra t-shirt, photo with the zebra guys, and all kinds of other cool stuff. So there's also the zebra VIP. Support the bands, you know. Yeah. It's, Go do the VIP. It's, oh, it's a great experience. Yeah. On that note, thank you so much, Randy. Thank you. A pleasure. Hope to see yeah, you thank one you guys. day. It was a lot of fun. All right. All the best. Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Hey, it's KK, Metal Voice Man in the Street. Tonight I'm at Daryl's house and I'm with the members of Zebra, Randy and Felix. Zebra is one of my favorite bands since the early 80s. I've been following them since I was a kid out in Long Island. Them, Twisted Sister, Rat Race Choir, they all took over Long Island and it was great to see them all make it one by one. They put out three great albums. I mean, honestly, this is my favorite. Thanks. Really? Okay. This one, it, time, Thanks. my favorite song. Thanks. And do you guys have a favorite out of, out of this? What would your favorites be out of these? Four. Well, look, then you came back and... We have this fourth been, album, yeah. Right, the, the fourth, fourth album, album right. I think it was 2003, three, three? Three, I think. That's, that was, that's good, too. That was on Frontiers. Yeah, I like that record. So do you have a favorite out of any of these? A particular songs? Or album? Um, oh, I'd, I would say the first record all out of all of them. Big, I mean, you think about it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I mean, each one to me, has, I like, uh, I really like Don't Walk Away on that record. I mean, I know everybody loves all the other songs. This one just flows, start yeah, to finish. Yeah, yeah, really and then, mean. but uh, there's a song called But No More on this record that's a really cool song. Yeah. Well, this was just like the part two of it. It just flowed right into it, I thought. Yeah. This was a little different. Yeah, Came this was a different a third, record, but I also thought that that record was a lot more cohesive. Yeah, the third record's more of a, I think all the songs work together better to, as, a, as a collection. So now you, I want to thank you, Randy, personally on the side for doing all those shows during the pandemic. You, that oh. was great. I was coming home on the train and I would watch them every I worked straight through the pandemic. I worked wow. in, in a building that was open all the time. It was a news agency in that building. Well, good for you. And um, that really helped me on the train on the way home every night. You did about four o'clock, I think, every afternoon. Yep, it was and an And I would look forward show. to getting on the train and, and popping that on. <laughs> it was a good time. And you were taking requests even. He yeah. was, he was. Yep, yep. And um, you're, you're always busy. I see, I've seen you with Hindenburg. I've seen you jumping yep. around all the time. Yep. And I uh, play with another tribute band called Cashmere. Cash? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we got the Beatles, right? You saw the Beatles? Right? Saw the Beatles. Yep, in Did New you Orleans. See no. You saw them? I saw them, yeah. My parents uh, took my brother and I to see the Beatles, 1964, and uh, at City Park Stadium in New Orleans. Oh. And, uh, it was quite an event, I got to tell you. The uh, the girls emptied the seat. They got out of their seats. They ran on the field. It was just like a no, hard that's day's something night. to be. Yeah, it was I wild. told people my first concert was Queen, but you, you taught me. You definitely <laughs> knocked me out. It was it was something else. Mm -hmm. All right, so have a great show tonight. Thank you for taking your time. Oh, thanks. Thanks for coming out tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show. And you're watching the Metal Voice. Thank you guys. <laughs>